Robinson and welcome to Ask the Specialist. Tonight we ask the lawyers on CMU Public Television. Welcome to Ask the Lawyers, the program where your calls fuel our conversation. Please give us a call with any questions you have for our guests. Let me introduce our guest this evening. Uh, John Lewis from Holtz, Helder and Lewis, PLLC. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having us. Tell us a little bit about uh, areas you specialize in or areas of law that you practice. Our firm is a traditional general practice firm. I specialize in litigation cases, cases involving criminal charges, uh, civil suits, and uh, domestic litigation. Okay, very good. Thanks and welcome. Thank you. Also with us tonight is Donald Soule of Gray, Soul and Ayako, PC. Welcome. Thank you for having us. And, and what is your area? We only handle personal injury cases, which could be auto accidents, workers' comp, social security, medical malpractice, any kind of personal injury. All right, very good. Welcome to both of you. So let's start with personal injury, and let's start with a broad question. Uh, what do I do if I've been injured in an auto accident? Take me from when the bumpers collide to when perhaps we would contact an attorney. What are some of the things we should remember? Yeah, I think the first thing you want to do is make sure you and your passengers are okay. If you need medical attention, get that as fast as possible. Call 911, check on the people in the other vehicle. And then once things settle down, you can begin to worry about getting your information about insurance to give to the police and your driver's license. But I think the personal injury, uh, the people's safety is the biggest thing at first. And so what sort of um, information do we need? And do we need that information in any um, accident, even if it's a <clears throat> fender bender, so to speak, in terms of changing insurance company information? Yes, you'd want to have your proof of insurance in your car, and the police will want to see your registration. Mm -hmm. You want to have your driver's license, make sure it's up to date, and that if you wear glasses, you're wearing your glasses. All righty, thanks. Um, John, let me ask you, I have a question here regarding workman's comp, workers' comp, I should say. I get injured on the job, and now my employer won't turn the claim into the workers' compensation carrier. What should I do? That's probably a better question for Don to I answer. I could see that coming. Yeah. Okay. Does that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Don. For some reason, many employers, when you tell them you got hurt on the job, they don't want to turn it in. Well, there are ways of finding out. You can call the state of Michigan. There's an insurance number, and you can ask the insurance carrier's name for your employer on the date of injury. Or you can uh, go to H&R if you have a human resources department and try and get them to do it. But if they have the insurance policy, they should promptly report it, but uh, it, sometimes you have to push back and ultimately call an attorney mm -hmm. and they'll make sure it gets turned in. Alrighty. So John, can we talk divorce? Sure. All right. Uh, what paperwork do I need? If there's a um, couple out there, an individual considering divorce, give us some thoughts on how they might want to proceed and what paperwork would be involved. A lot of firms like ours have a checklist that we provide to our clients telling them to gather the normal things that you keep around the house, your deeds. Um, your mortgage note documents, your car titles, information regarding pension and retirement accounts, investment accounts if you have a, an, an investment portfolio, information that can show us the type of marital estate you have as far as the, the scope and value of the assets. And we use that as a starting point to start deciding what else do we need to gather information wise. Because one of the things that we have to do is decide, or three things really, what do you own, what is it worth, and then start deciding who's going to get what. And so if they can have those documents available for us, it saves a lot of cost in your divorce and doing what we call discovery and trying to figure out what that is. And I think we've all heard about, you know, uh, bitter, difficult divorces and amicable divorces. Um, do you see a trend? It, it, are people able to work through it amicably? And, and is there a difference if your <coughs> children are involved? I always jokingly tell people not to spend their kids' college education in getting their divorce through. And, and that always gets a laugh, but I, the goal really is to try to find a way to get a divorce with dignity, and that doesn't always happen because there's emotions involved mm -hmm. in it. Um, but there's been a move in the last 20 years towards conciliation in divorce cases and using mediators and facilitators to help with the process of deciding who gets what. The more the parents can agree and work together, especially on the, the property issues, um, it can save you a lot of money, but also in the kid issues. When you're talking about custody, parenting time, support, um, we're doing a lot of mediation and facilitation with that as well. And the, the science tells us that the more the parents get along during the divorce process, the better the outcomes are for the children. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, sure, there's been a lot of move 
to get away from some of this combat type of litigation and into trying to find some common ground between the parents. And save the kids' college fund. That's right. Yeah, That's get right. that on a t-shirt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Don, I have a question from Kalkaska. What steps are taken to um, declare someone incompetent? I, I suppose it would be uh, maybe someone who's mentally ill or mentally incapacitated to declare them incompetent to handle their own affairs. And how can uh, someone help a person in that situation? How could an attorney help? Sure. And I get into that tangentially if some of my clients have maybe a closed head injury and are unable to take care of themselves. But ultimately, somebody's competency would be ruled on in the probate court. They would have, if they're contesting it, they have the right to hire their own attorney, have an, a doctor examine them. Uh, if somebody's a danger to themselves or others, I believe they can be held 72 hours in a hospital setting. So you have to look to the person's mental health and what type of help they need. What is, is the incompetency, they can't handle their financial affairs, but they're able to live at home and cook and clean? Or is it something, they, do they need a full guardianship or to be in a custodial situation? But ultimately, you'd end up in a probate court hearing if that was necessary to have a conservative or guardian appointed. Mm -hmm. So does this typically come down to testimony between doctors? It could. Mm -hmm. Many times, the person that's... Uh, the subject of the proceeding may not be contesting it. So it might be just a, a state psychiatrist or a doctor testifying. All right, thank you. I have a question from North Bradley. Explain work, workers' compensation, uh, an offset when it comes to Social Security. Who, who feels? I can do that. Who wants to take that one? What happens is some people are eligible for both workers' comp and Social Security disability. And if you're, uh, under Social Security retirement age, Social Security will take an offset. You'll get your full comp. But once you go on to old age Social Security, leave Social Security disability, then it goes the other way. The uh, workers' comp carrier takes a 50% credit against your old age Social Security. But it's just to make sure that you don't make more money not working than working. Okay. So one benefit or the other is going to go up or down. Sure, sure. All right, fair Very enough. Interesting. We're asking the lawyers on CMU Pul Public Television. We encourage you to call with questions that you have. You can also reach us on Twitter at WCMU underscore AskThe and on Facebook at Facebook.com AskTheSpecialist. Please join us. A question from Houghton Lake talks about suing for mental anguish. Now, it doesn't, it's not terribly specific, but, but give us some thoughts uh, when it comes to involving mental anguish in a lawsuit. Sure. When you get into, say, an auto accident, you have physical injuries, but there's also a mental component. Uh, suppose you're driving your family and a drunk driver runs into you. You get upset seeing your family injured. And uh, I remember a local attorney described going to the emergency room and seeing the place littered with the bodies of his children and wife who'd been in a car accident. Mm -hmm. So people do have an emotional component to their injury, and the law describes that in the word mental anguish, but it really is just your emotional upset at having been in an accident and being injured. Mm -hmm. And so um, how is that pursued or how is that okay. proven in court? It's an element of damage. So you would uh, have the plaintiff testify that how it affected them emotionally and mentally. The doctor may testify about how they had the broken arm and how they set it and went through a hospital procedure, but the person themselves, the injured party, would testify how it affected them emotionally. Mm -hmm. And then a jury can weigh that. They can disregard it, believe it, or give you a lot of money damages. Mm -hmm. All right, very good, thank you. Um, John, a question from Grand Blank. Uh, we have a, a person who's been with his girlfriend for 13 years, uh, were never married, but are now broken up, and is wondering how to get custody of the children. That's uh, a good question. I thought you were going to go into some sort of a property part on that. Michigan doesn't have a common law marriage, so that's okay. not. But the kid issues are, are decided the same way in Michigan in a non-marriage relationship as they are in a divorce situation. They would have to file a proceeding under the Michigan Child Custody Act if they were seeking issue, determination of the issues of custody and parenting time. A lot of times in those situations where people break up, they try to just pursue a, a support action and there's a family support action that can be brought just on providing support for the child from the non-custodial parent to the, the primary custodial parent. But it, I think your caller is asking about custody specifically mm -hmm. and in those circumstances you can file a complaint for custody. The matter will be referred to the local uh, friend of the court for that county. The friend of the court will conduct referee hearings typically or referee investigations or, or case investigations to determine which parent it's in the child's best interest to be with. Mm -hmm. And then the non-custodial parent will have uh, parenting time, anywhere from a very specific schedule of every other weekend, six weeks in the summer, alternating holidays, half of Christmas break, 
um, or to an, an including a 50-50 custody arrangement. It all depends on the circumstance of the parents. What a lot of courts like to do is recreate the role that the parent had in the intact family, whether they're married or not. What was mom doing? What was dad doing? Who was the primary caregiver for the child? And then based on those circumstances in your particular family, try to fashion a custody order or a parenting time order that meets the children's needs, the best interest factors. Now, so. you, were, you were speaking earlier about um, divorces, kind of the trend to try and make them more amicable. So when it comes to custody, are you seeing any trends there? Do, are, are courts trend, tending now to give more 50-50 custody or less 50? I mean, are you seeing any sort of trends? Excellent, excellent question. I think that since I've been a lawyer since 1987, the move has clearly moved towards the, the, the the, uh, the goal has moved towards a joint custody arrangement. A lot of judges start in their mind with 50-50 being the way it should be and then tell us why it shouldn't be. A lot of work has been done to the family law section of the State Bar of Michigan to try to move legislation towards a presumption of 50-50 custody and then tell us why it shouldn't be. But we still see a lot of traditional relationships out there too where one parent or the other has been the stay-at-home parent and the other parent has been the wage earning parent. And in those situations, 50-50 custody might not be realistic mm -hmm. and the other parent might have to be um, involved more on a visiting parent standpoint. But I think the trend um, is towards 50-50 custody. And, and then finally, one more, uh, let's stay on this topic for a minute. How do I change my custody or visitation or support order? It would depend if it's after the divorce has already been entered. You can file a post-judgment motion for modification of the custody provision of your divorce. And a post-judgment motion is more difficult than an initial custody determination because the law is set up to preserve the custody arrangement that was established at the time that the divorce was entered. In, in le unless you have clear and convincing, or excuse me, not clear and convincing, but unless you have a change in circumstances or proper cause shown, and in some cases, clear and convincing evidence that it should be changed, they're going to stay with, they're gonna stay the course. It's designed to try to preserve the last order unless you can come in and show us some reason to change it. And in order to do that, you would have to file a request with your local court and it would be referred again to the friend of the court and there would be a whole hearing procedure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take a look for a minute at workers' compensation. And um, Don, I'm wondering, are gradual injuries or uh, occupational diseases covered? Yes, there are certain times when a person goes to work and they've got a heavy lifting job, they bend over and they hurt the back in one incident, go to the hospital and get treated. Other times, there's a wear and tear, an accumulation, and they, we call those last day of work type injuries where you can't point to one day, but you got worn out on over many, many days, and that can be a, a diagnosed uh, medical condition mm -hmm. from that, and it could be compensable, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, can a worker sue for damages other than work, workers' compensation? There is a, an intentional tort exception so that if some other third party other than your employer or a co-employee injured you, you can ensue, like if you're driving on the job and get hit by a negligent party, you still have a claim against the negligent party outside of comp. But we call it the exclusive remedy. If you're hurt by a, a co-employee or something your employer did, you're stuck in uh, the comp system unless you can prove the employer under the intentional tort exception intended to harm you. Michigan case law is not friendly to that cause of action. Okay, and let's stay on this topic for a minute. I have a call from Houghton Lake. Uh, saying there was a slip and fall four years ago and now this person can't use their hand. Uh, can he still file a claim now four years later? Four years is probably one year too late. Michigan has a three-year statute of limitation for a slip and fall injury. So I think it's uh, something you, it's, when it's, an injury happens, if you have any questions, you should call an attorney early on so that you make sure you don't miss in a, have a statute of limitations lapse. All right, very good, thank you. Um, let's talk about wills for a minute and from Lake City, someone with a simple question, what should you never put in a will? <laughs> I'll let you both have a swing at this one. You know, I've never been asked that question, so I'm not <laughs> sure I can fashion a very good answer to that. Um, I've seen all manner of things put in wills. I've seen uh, provisions for animals, of course, and, mm -hmm. and people, uh, oh. one of the favorite questions is, is what can I put in there to, to um, say where my children are going to go and so we get a lot of common questions about what goes in a will. I'm not sure I have an answer for what should <laughs> never be put in a will. All right. Um, Since I last wrote a will 30 years ago, I'm going to let that one alone. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just saying, I don't think there's anything that could be legally excluded from. There's a lot of direction that you can provide with that. You can even get more creative with a trust document mm -hmm. and, uh, and really control your estate and the disposition of those estates in a trust um, beyond the grave, if you will, and, and you can get quite fancy with that kind of a document. Wills are intended to be a simple process, okay. whereas trust documents give you more control. But as far as what shouldn't go in there, I'm not sure there's any preclusion. All right. Everything including the kitchen sink. There you go. Yeah. What's the length of time? We, we talked a little about, about divorce earlier, but from Reed City we have a question. What's the length of time it takes to get a divorce if there are no complications? And I suppose this depends whether there are children <laughs> or not children as well. Yes, Michigan has what they call cooling off periods. In a divorce without children, it's a 60 day period. You can't get divorced any sooner than 60 days unless you can show the court that there's some circumstances why. In a divorce with children, that cooling off period is six months. And the goal is that they want to give the parties time during those periods to reflect on whether they want to actually go through with the divorce. If there's any opportunity for reconciliation, they want to give them an opportunity to explore that as well. So we call it the cooling off period. There are exceptions where you can shorten those periods of time if you can show the court that there's some reason why you should. Um, but generally it'll be that. Now, most judges are fond of uh, keeping track of how long their cases track through their system. Even though they can get done that soon, they don't typically get done that quickly. Uh, in Isabella County, it's my understanding that 90% of the cases are done within nine months. And so that's probably trending pretty consistent with the Central Michigan, West Central Michigan area, that it takes about that long to get through. Um, you can get done within that six month period though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. very good. Let's talk about medical malpractice, Don, and sure. uh, what should I do if I think a hospital or doctor made a mistake in the keep, uh, treatment or care like of my loved one? The first thing I tell people, a bad result doesn't necessarily mean malpractice. And malpractice in Michigan is a term of art for violating the standard of care for what the doctor or hospital should have done in any particular circumstance. And the first thing, if you go to a, you're going to have to go to a lawyer most likely, and uh, the first thing we would do is order all your medical records, review them, have a nurse look at them, and then send them out to a medical expert. And without medical expert testimony, you can't even file a complaint in Michigan. It's, we had reforms in 1995, a lot of people don't realize that uh, you have to have a board certified orthopedist against a board certified orthopedic defendant to give an affidavit of merit to go with the complaint before a lawyer can file a complaint. So it's, it's a very rigorous process and very few cases are filed in Michigan. I think there were less than a thousand malpractice cases filed last year because it is so difficult. So is this, was this an effort to get rid of the so-called frivolous lawsuits? I never believed in frivolous lawsuits. Well, I was going to ask I, you what your take was on it too. Yes. Number one, lawyers would go broke. We are businessmen. We don't want frivolous cases. We would don't, And I would never want to accuse a professional of making a mistake unless I had a very good case. Mm -hmm. So we take that very seriously. We don't want to, I, most of my time is screening cases telling people you probably don't have a case. And uh, I think that protects the doctors too. They wouldn't believe it, but uh, <laughs> it is a very serious allegation and you, you've got to have evidence. So then what kind of fees are associated with getting an attorney to help you with medical malpractice? Uh, most personal injury cases are done on what we call a contingency fee. So we don't get paid unless we win. The Supreme Court sets that as one third of the recovery after deduction of costs. And the confusion there is uh, they, they call the contingency fee feed the poor man's keys to the courthouse. Some people that can't afford a, a lawyer can then get there because a the lawyer will take the risk that I might lose the case and get nothing, but that's why we screen cases very closely. And that uh, it definitely levels the playing field. A person can hire an attorney and you don't have to be afraid to go after GM on a product liability case or a doctor or hospital on a malpractice case because with the contingency fee system you can find somebody to represent you. Okay, thank you. And taking a taking yes. a one third contingency fee on a frivolous or a weak case is not a good business decision because a third of zero. <laughs> <laughs> there is still the bottom line. That's yes. Right. yes, absolutely. You're tuned to Ask the Specialists on CMU Public Television, and we're inviting your uh, comments. We have a comment. We'd like a question from Facebook. Where could you get help legally if you have a major issue with teachers in your school system? Hmm is the question we have. It's a broad question and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a toss up. And depending <laughs> on the type of question or problem, but a lot of parents have problems with the special education programming that's being provided to their students and you know federal law and state law requires certain levels of, of intervention and services be provided to our special needs kids and a lot of times people have to resort to the legal remedies available in those statutes in order to get help 
And there are some great lawyers who do that in the Lansing area. I've not done that kind of work since the early um, 90s, but there are people who can help you there. If you have a problem, for instance, with the school board or the way that the school's being run, there are people who specialize in uh, literally school board law. There's a firm in Lansing that does nothing but represent school boards. Um, so it all depends on the type of problem they're having with the school, if it deals with academics, if it deals with sports participation. Um, and, and in some cases, people are facing expulsion because of drugs or, or guns or weapons in, in the school. Um, there are um, people who help you keep your student reinstated if possible or to minimize the, the penalty that they receive from the school. So the, it's a very broad question to know. Right, right. Um, but there are attorneys who have developed practices that center around what we call school law. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're available by calling the state bar. They can refer you to people who do that. Now, can it be very difficult to sue, for example, a school district because as a state entity? Is there, are there special protections? For an injury, I would assume that there's some immunity issues. Don. There are governmental immunity issues mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a governmental agency. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a question from Kalkaska. Don, I think this would be for you. A uh, person who was injured in 1964, uh, Ford Mustang car accident, had a broken back, and uh, now her back is killing her. What can she do now? Is there any recourse left? I think that ship has sailed, but I'm sorry she's having problems. Our no-fault system went into effect in 1973, so if she was hurt after 1973, she would continue, unless she settled her case, she'd still have lifetime medical. And in, in that sense, Michigan's, uh, Michigan's uh, No-Fault Act is one of the best in the country with lifetime medical protection, but I think in 64, there's, number one, the statute of limitations for the negligent party case of three years is gone, and she wouldn't have had no-fault health insurance, so. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I can't help her there. Okay. All right. We hear from Flint. I have a child who I just found out is mine. The child is nine years old. Do I have a cause of action to sue because I'm now being asked for child support? And um, then conversely, can the child sue because they were not informed of the other parent's existence? Fascinating. <laughs> there I'm are funding some... that one over there. <laughs> I, I saw you looking this way. I think that's a question for John. The parent sounds like the parent who would be the, the father in the case, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so my guess is that he wants to know why he wasn't told that he had a child all these years. I'm not sure that I've seen a case um, suing somebody for failing to disclose that you had my child. Um, unfortunately for him, if he is biologically connected to the child and that's confirmed with uh, DNA blood testing, he'll have a support obligation um, irrespective of the lack of contact over that nine pe year period of time. Uh, because he is the biological parent, he has a duty of support under Michigan law, and they'll be able to, to enforce that. And specifically, if the mother of the child is receiving any state resources, Medicaid or, or a benefit package, um, she has to name the biological father in order to continue to receive her benefits and they will pursue him. Michigan has a case pending in the Court of Appeals where the father was um, literally a, a donor um, father and a sperm donor or some sort of a cryogenically preserved zygote kind of case and found out later that the mother was successful in having a child and he was forced at the um, circuit court level to be responsible for a support obligation. So there's that support obligation. Can you turn around and sue for not being told? I'm not sure that it would be much of a cause of action there. Okay. So. All right. Very good. Thank you. I got into a collision. My airbag didn't go off. Don, can I sue the car manufacturer? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, uh, we do have some product liability law still left in Michigan. We've been tort reform there too, like malpractice. but. Uh, an airbag is designed to go off in a certain angle of crash and a certain speed of crash. So we don't want it, if you're in a situation where you just barely move forward and tunk a wall or something, you don't want it to go off too early, but you don't want to get a head-on collision not have it go off. So if you can show that the bag sensor did not go off properly through engineering evidence, you could have a case against the manufacturer. But unless you're catastrophically injured, the cost of pursuing that case would be extreme. So. It would also depend on how bad you or your passengers were injured. Okay, and then talking about car insurance, if the car insurance is, um, company is holding off on paying medical bills, what recourse uh, does the individual have? Yeah, under Michigan law, there's a one-year back rule under the No-Fault Act. So if, if you, you have to turn a claim in within one year to the no-fault carrier that insures your vehicle, if that's the priority. And then if you incur a bill that they don't pay, you have one year to sue them. So if you incurred a bill on January 1st, 
and by the following year, January 1st, it isn't paid, you've got to sue them or it's too late. So you want to stay on top of what bills okay. have been paid or not paid. Okay, but you can good. certainly hire an attorney to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I love this show. We cover a lot of territory. <laughs> From Aspen, Michigan, I have fruit trees along a road. Is it legal for someone to uh, pick fruit from them, even if they're in the road right of way? Well, it depends on what they're defining as the road right of way. Um, if their property um, is, uh, roads have historically either been deeded right of ways or they're easement based right of ways. Um, irrespective, you still own the land underneath the uh, where the tree's at, even though the road may have some right to use a portion of it. So for them to come onto your property and take your fruit would be a trespass, and the fruit being your personal property once picked would be a theft. Um, that would be a simple answer. Now, has anybody ever been prosecuted for stealing a, an apple <laughs> off of a tree? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So it happens all the time, I'm sure, and people would probably like to stop that. And, uh, and probably the easiest way is to put up no trespassing signs or have a, a, a fence there. Um, but uh, is it illegal? Probably would be a theft crime. <laughs> Thank I'm you. not sure anybody would be practically prosecuted. <laughs> right. so. We're closing in on just the final minutes of the program, but uh, we've talked a couple times now, Don, about people interested in filing um, mm -hmm. uh, personal injury cases, yes. and they were outside of the three years. So now we have one that is apparently at least in that time All frame. Right. From Waterford, uh, someone who fell from a step a year ago and in wondering if they can sue their landlord, or if not, is there anything that they can do at this point? It's very interesting area of law right now if we call it a trip and fall or a slip and fall it's very difficult in Michigan a landlord has some duties statutorily to maintain a safe premise so if the landlord breaches that duty there would be a case but there are some other cases that talk about maybe the landlord doesn't have a duty to repair common areas if it's a multi-unit apartment so you'd really have to give a lot of facts to whatever attorneys evaluating it to see it but yes there may be a case Okay, very good, and we are out of time. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. You've been watching Ask the Lawyers. I'm Amy Robinson, and thanks to our guest today, uh, John Lewis from Holtz, Helder & Lewis, PLLC, and thanks to Donald Soule of uh, Gray, Soul & Iaco PC. Thank you. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to our phone operators for taking your calls, and we invite you to join us uh, next week for our Ask the Realtors. I'm Amy Robinson, and good night. <laughs>